So there I was coming up with some subtle YouTube thumbnails when I noticed a reply to one of my tweets. My tweet was basically saying that there are two different checklists when it comes to NFTs. There's one you use when trying to see if an NFT can get to one ETH and one you use to see if it can get to 10 ETH. And I received a lot of the same replies. What's your 10 ETH checklist? What's your one to 10 ETH checklist? Give me that damn checklist and no one gets hurt. All right, that last one wasn't real. Look, I watched one Sopranos clip and now my entire YouTube feed is just mobsters getting whacked in Jersey diners. But look, you get the gist. And so I was like, okay, cool. That's a video idea, right? How to spot NFTs that get to 10 ETH. That's pretty useful. And it is something that I've done before. So I do think that I have some tips. In my first year in NFTs, I managed to buy Board Ape Yacht Club, Azuki, Doodles, Cryptodes, Cool Cats, Curio Cards, Solana Monkey Business, and Genesis Legions. All of which at one point hit the 10 ETH mark or 10 ETH equivalent. Some kept going well beyond that, some pulled back hard, but my average buy-in across all those NFTs was a little over one ETH. Now that doesn't mean that I don't also make a ton of mistakes, okay? I've missed out on endless opportunities, including not minting V Friends and Clone X, even though I was right there at the mint. And I also passed on Cyber Kongs and World of Women early on. The good news is that all those mistakes have helped me refine my strategy and my filters to help me maybe get a better chance of picking the next 10x or 100x NFT. So with that said, let's get into it. And the first thing I want to cover is something I've also talked about in the past, which is that you can almost think of NFTs as two different games right now. Okay, you have the market below 2 ETH and you have the market above 2 ETH. The actual line doesn't really matter. It's not meant to be super accurate, but this is a good framework to use. But what I mean is that generally there are some stark differences between the high end and the low end of the market okay at the low end you are normally dealing with a less sophisticated buyer base and just consider that the nft market doubles basically every three to four months and so you do get these new traders that have less money they have a worse understanding of the market and so they tend to come in for new mints or just nfts below maybe one or two ETH. now i'm not saying they're dumb okay we all have to start somewhere but i am saying that they're basically white belts and more prone to mistakes in contrast the people who buy above two ETH tend to have a little bit more experience. They tend to be a little more savvy with markets. Maybe they made their money with DeFi or crypto trading, or they earned in some other industry before this. Again, I'm not saying they're smarter. You know, it could be that they just inherited money or they just got really lucky. But in general, it tends to be a more sophisticated buyer. Now, why does this matter? Well, because regardless of who the buyer is, there's one thing they can both agree on, and that's that a like button should never be left unsmashed. So guys, you know what to do. No, but really it matters because the factors that appeal to buyers at the low end are often gonna be very different than the factors that appeal to buyers at the high end. And we are gonna get into those factors in a minute, but in general, this makes sense, right? If you're buying something for two ETH and hoping that it 10 X's, then at that point, you're hoping that one day someone's gonna spend 20 or 25 ETH on this. And so it has to be a JPEG worthy of spending six figures. Whereas at the lower end, if you're buying something for 0.07 ETH and hoping it gets to 0.7 ETH, which would still be a 10x that might be an easier task because all you have to do is convince someone to spend still less than one ETH on a JPEG. So with that said, let's look at some of the factors that really influence a project at this lower tier. First off, new buyers seem to love flashy art. The flashier, the better. Oh, you have a 3D model and it's walking around. That sounds like generational wealth to me. You have bright colors and thick sided lines? Inject that right into my veins. That's why a lot of sketchy projects tend to follow the same type of style, okay? Because they're targeting less sophisticated buyers and this is what they think blue chip NFTs should look like. Okay, another big factor is going to be influencer pumps. So celebrities can still impact even top collections, okay? One of the biggest run-ups in Board Ape Yacht Club happened after Justin Bieber bought his ape. But in the market below two ETH, you just have a much wider cap of characters that can have an impact okay it could be any moderately famous person from the 90s or any current d-lister it's like yeah your project's pretty good but you know what would make it even more interesting if we got that guy who played mr feeney on boy meets world to retweet it or how about hagrid can we get him to show some play to earn game for us seriously think about how many tiktokers have tens of millions of subscribers if you never heard of them and think about that impact that they can have on a collection of just you know 5,000 tokens okay next we have copycat metas so we're never going to have a 20 ETH collection called something like Kid Zuki, but can it hit 0.5 ETH? Uh, also probably not, but we have seen some of these do well before, like Larva Lads, which did get up to around 0.7 ETH at one point. And yeah, all NFTs are inspired in some way by other NFTs, but true copycats, meaning that they just rip off their name or try to ride their hype a little too much, 
they just don't go very far because sophisticated buyers are always gonna prefer just having the original. Okay. Another factor will be Ponzi-nomics. So here I'm referring to some mechanics that you'll find in some popular play to earn games today, okay? So maybe you're taking the NFT, you're staking it for some passive tokens. There's probably not much underlying utility and not much fun involved at all. And so you'll get a ton of people who start tweeting about how they're making passive income, you know, $1,000 a day, and that encourages more people to just pile in and so on and so forth. And these aren't textbook Ponzi's, but they are unsustainable. And now sophisticated buyers have have caught on and so they tend to not buy in at higher prices because they know that it's hard to maintain it at that level okay one last factor that does well at lower tiers would be unrealistic roadmaps let's take video games as an example so you may have noticed that a lot of these nfts tend to promise that they're going to make a video game tied to their nft down the road not just like a social game but a large-scale virtual world that can scale up to millions of players now to be clear this is one of the hardest things you can do and even most game developers fail at it despite dedicating their lives to this yet if you don't know anything about game development which let's face it most nft buyers don't then you wouldn't see a problem with a team of 20 year old marketers saying that they can get it done and do it well however the higher the floor price goes the fewer buyers you're going to find that you can convince unless you have some really unfair advantage like a ton of resources to hire the best people or you already have some a tier developer on your team okay so those are some of the many factors that influence an nft at the lower price points but now let's focus on the second category which are nfts that can get up to 10 eth or more for this i'm going to focus on a specific category of nft which are the profile pick collections or more broadly we can think of them as metaverse identity brands and the way i look at it it really boils down to two different sets of factors you have the meme and you have the vehicle and we'll go through these one by one but under the meme you have the art and you have the story and then under the vehicle, we can put the founder, the strategy and resources. And what you're basically looking for is a 10 out of 10 in either category or as close as a 10 out of 10 as you can get. Otherwise, you could get by with just decent scores across all these factors, but it's better in my opinion to have at least one that's outstanding. So let's start with the meme, okay? With profile pics, yes, the art is going to be a big deal, but it doesn't have to be super stylish or even be, you know, very technically impressive, okay? It just has to resonate with people. If you look at some of the most popular cartoon brands, you'll see that the styles are all over the place and they don't have to be beautiful works of art to get a huge following. To be honest, we haven't had a blue chip profile pic emerge simply because the art is amazing, okay? It's just not enough. And on top of that, you also have to have a story that goes along with the meme, okay? And this is going to be the why of the brand. Basically, what is the NFT supposed to make you feel and what is the signal that it's sending out, okay? Is it supposed to be cool? Is is it exclusive? Is it countercultural and purposely weird? Okay, this is all part of what you're buying. If you look at Azuki, for example, I do think they've done a good job with the story. They're a cool brand that is going to be metaverse first. There's an anime angle to the story. There's a gaming angle where they have these, you know, super smash stations at their parties. So these are all the signals that you might be giving off when you rock an Azuki profile pic. Okay, now let's talk about the vehicle, aka the growth vehicle. The thing to know here is that when you're buying into a roadmap based profile pick collection generally what you're buying into is a product with a singular mission if we take a look at nouns which is one of the most successful profile pick collections that i don't think people talk enough about they actually make this more explicit than any other collection i've seen here we have the founder in the first line of the first medium post saying nouns is a protocol for proliferating nouns when you think of the utility of these profile pick brands if you're thinking just about the next airdrop that you're going to receive or how many tokens you can get if you stake it or if you get excited when you see a convoluted map like this one you're thinking way too small the real long-term utility for me in my opinion is owning a Genesis piece from a collection that goes truly mainstream, okay? A franchise that people recognize and love even outside the context of NFTs. If that does happen, then it's pretty likely that you are gonna be rewarded in some ways, even if we're thinking of just the collectible value of the Genesis tokens. With that in mind, I don't see how you can have a bull thesis on a profile pick collection without considering how it might go viral. And that pathway, that strategy is the vehicle. So what are some examples of vehicles? Well, one obvious one would be the creator or the founder take moonbirds for example okay it hit 24 eth within its first week after launch 
partly because people have so much belief in the collection's founder, Kevin Rose. Or with Board Ape Yacht Club, it was clear early on that the founders Yuga Labs had insane execution and people started to make big bets on that. You really can't stress this enough, okay? What we've seen is that, you know, across all the top blue chips, Having a strong team is a pretty consistent factor, okay? You have Cyber Kongs, Azuki, Doodles, Board Ape Yacht Club. The only exception really is CryptoPunks, which, you know, they get to lean on being a historically significant collection, and there aren't many of those. Okay, next off, we have the strategy. So how exactly do they plan on growing the brand, okay? Are they gonna make a TV show? Are they gonna make a game? And if so, what are the chances that they can pull it off, right? Do they have an unfair advantage? Or maybe they're letting the community grow the brand, okay? This is the strategy with CC0 or public domain NFTs like Cryptodes. And I think that if in the future we do see a blue chip with apps and founders, it's likely to come out of one of these public domain collections. This is because we know from the past that memes like Pepe the Frog can get incredibly viral without a big push from their founders and they can just take on a life of their own and become virtually everywhere. Okay, another big factor are the resources. Basically, do they have a lot of money? Okay, if we take Nouns, for example, they have somewhere around 70 million in their treasury or Moonbirds where the team now has 65 million after that mint plus many millions more from royalties. That kind of money goes a long way, right? Because now you can hire the best talent, you can have the biggest IRL parties, you can invest in sophisticated products and so on. Okay, so that's a general checklist, but how do you actually spot one of these NFTs before they blow up? Well, basically you wanna look for organic traction, okay? And this is not that different than if you were to invest in a startup where the founder usually begins with a MVP or minimum viable product, which is basically an experiment to find out if your product actually clicks with customers before they add more features and invest more money into it. And if it does get traction, they often approach angel investors, they show them their progress, and the angel might cut them a check to get to the next step. I think we have this in NFTs as well. And the Genesis collection is pretty much the MVP, right? It's a test of how much demand there exists for that brand. And when something does get a bit of traction, whether that's on social media before a mint or in terms of sales after the mint, your job is basically to determine what the level of quality is for that attention. And this is where that zero to two checklist is important because you wanna see if it's popular because of those reasons that tend to attract less sophisticated buyers, but which will lead to the collection hitting that wall at one to two ETH. So let's take an example, okay? One of the most hyped upcoming collections is Imaginary Ones. This one has a ton of traction, nearly 500,000 followers already, which is very rare for an NFT. So it begs the question, why are people so into this? At this point, you start running through the checklist, okay? It has very flashy art with some movement, and maybe this is a little more attractive to newbies. Then you head over and you look at the roadmap and you ask, okay, is there anything outstanding here? And do they have a realistic strategy for making this one of the biggest brands in the space and sustaining that attention? Then we head over to the team page and we ask, okay, what have they accomplished so far? Have they ever done anything at this scale? And if not, is there any reason to believe they're likely to hit a home run with this one? Again, what I'm trying to figure out is can they create a sustainable attention machine that can also attract people that are investing at much higher price points? If the answer to that is no, well, it doesn't mean you should just ignore it, you know, because there still could be a short-term trading opportunity, but now you're playing a completely different game altogether. Bottom line here is that even with this checklist, it's a very imperfect science. You're still gonna buy a bunch of NFTs that end up fizzling out. And all you're trying to do here is just to put the odds in your favor, even just a little bit. And as usual, this is just looking at NFTs from an investment angle, right? You can be buying NFTs just because you like the art or maybe because of some other utility that they offer. All right, guys, I'm gonna end it here. Thanks again for watching. I hope that was helpful and I'll catch you at the next video.